Thank you, Lord. I thank you that wisdom will flow today. I thank you that, Lord, you will be glorified in this place today. That our eyes will be open. We will get more understanding of who you are. That Christ in us will be revealed. And we will forever be changed from this day forth. And we give you praise for it. In Jesus' name. And all that agree said, Amen. Let's give God praise this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Let us take communion. If you have need of communion elements, if you would, raise your hands. Praise God. Take your bread. The bread represents the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which was broken for you and for me. It was broken so that you could be made whole. And we do this to remember what he has done. And what he has done is forever settled in heaven. It's forever settled in heaven. Your healed self is forever settled in heaven. Whatever was broken is forever, is forever healed in heaven. And we keep our minds set there this morning. You may eat. Take your cup. The cup represents the blood of Christ. It was the only thing that could deal with your sins once and for all. And he said, we do this to remember his sacrifice, his pouring out. You may drink. Somebody say, it is well with me and my house. That's your physical body and your house. You understand? Your body is the temple for, of the Holy Ghost. So he can live in you. And his blood has washed you pure. It has made you pure. Father, we thank you for this word today. I thank you that eyes will be open, Father. Bodies will be healed. Manifestation will take place, Father, as a result of hearing your word today. I thank you that it shall be you speaking through my vocal cords and thinking through my mind. I thank you that it shall be you ministering to the people today. Uh, your Lord, I yield myself unto you as a vessel to be used for the transporting of your word today. And I thank you that it will change lives, change hearts, minds. Father God, I thank you that those will come, they will come to the revelation of who you are, what you have done, and I thank you that we will be greater because of what you have done, and we give you thanks for it. We declare it is well with us and our households. Father, we thank you that we're declaring household salvation for everyone that is sitting under your word today, and I give you praise for it in Jesus' name. And all that agree said, amen. 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 Let's give God praise one more time. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. We are living in an age of what's called your truth. Everybody has what they call their truth. Um, we use social media to post our truth, uh, oftentimes not realizing that that truth is just your perception. And even though it's easy to put my truth out there, how, who am I hurting? Who am I confusing? Who am I, 
who am I leading astray? Um, today we're going to talk about knowing the truth. We're going to talk about knowing the truth. Uh, and I believe it's going to change your life. I believe that every time I come up here, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is ministering through me and he's ministering to you. Uh, he's speaking the word that you need to hear. Uh, you know what? I don't, and I don't want you to, to look at and play the number game. I don't want you to look at, well, how many are here? Because, I mean, you know, heaven rejoices even over one getting saved. You understand? Jesus had a multitude following him, but he was not afraid to say, hey, if you don't hate your mother, brother, sister, daughter, if you don't hate them, you can't be in my disciples. What was, what was he saying? He said, I'm elevating my relationship with the Father over me appearing a certain kind of way. Even though he had a multitude following him. So he wasn't, he wasn't afraid of the numbers. He, was, he wasn't afraid of being reduced down to 12 disciples because to him it was all about the changed heart. So when I'm up here ministering to you, it's not where you get a different message if the room was full or the room was empty. No, it's the same spirit of God ministering because he, he loves you all. He doesn't look at the numbers. He looks at the changed hearts. And I believe today as you come to know the truth, you will be forever changed by knowing the truth. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's go to the book of John. Chapter 8, and I'm reading out of the New King James Version. John chapter 8, we're going to go over here to verse 31. And I must warn you, there's a lot the Spirit of God has put on the inside of me, so... I may be going the wrong way, but the Spirit of God may say, you know what, let's, let's begin to, there's some things on the hearts of the people here, and he may begin to minister to you through me. So this is the direction I'm planning on going. <laughs> Amen. But every, every time I get up here and, and throughout the week, I'm, I'm thanking the Lord. I ask him to help me to flow with his spirit so that you all can get what you need and not me giving you what I think you need. Amen. 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 Uh, 31. 8. John chapter 8, verse 31, it says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, He says, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Somebody say abide. abide. Verse 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He didn't say if you read the truth. He said, if you know the truth. He said, if you know the truth, then the, it will make you free. He said, the truth will make you free. First, as we're understanding and coming to understanding and knowing the truth, we must really break it down so that we can not develop a perception of what the truth may be, but we have to know the truth. We have to see the truth. There is no compromising where the truth is concerned. And there can be no compromising whether you're going to believe the truth or believe the lie. You must choose to believe. Somebody say, I believe. I believe. So we want, we're going to break this down because how I many of you know it's good to be free? Amen? Amen? But you want to know what you're free from. And you want to know what you're free to do. Because you don't want to, you don't want to kind of take this and say, well, I'm free to do whatever I want to do. And you don't want to take this and, and not know what you're free from. So freedom has two sides. It's what you're free from and then what you're free to do. So we want to know the truth because it says knowing the truth will make us free. So what is the truth? Let's go over to John chapter 1. I apologize in advance if my voice go out of pitch, but I'm going through a healing this morning. 
So I th I'm thanking God it's already said and done. Amen. Amen. John chapter 1, verse 14. It says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So looking at this, we already know that Jesus is the word. Okay? The word became flesh. The word became Christ. You must, you have to always look at the scriptures. When, you, when you're looking at the scriptures and you're reading the scriptures, you have to always know that Jesus is the word. Whatever you look at, because what happens is you'll, you'll take... I mean, you know, if you continue in, let's just say you continued in the uh, book of Moses, or not book of Moses, but uh, Exodus, the law of Moses, I mean, you know, that's not going to make you free. But he said, if you can continue and you abide in me, if you continue in the word, then the word, will, the, what, the truth will make you free. Jesus is the word. He said, the word became flesh. The word of God, Jesus, full of grace and truth. Somebody say, Jesus is the word. Let's go over to verse 17. It says, for the law was given through Moses, and grace and truth came through Jesus. How, how did grace and truth come? Through Jesus. So here we, it's a clear distinction that the law of Moses is not the truth. It's not, the law of Moses is not the truth. Jesus is the truth. Jesus full of grace and truth. You can't separate grace and truth. Grace is the truth. His unmerited favor, which is the person of Jesus Christ, is the truth. He says, and if you continue in my word, who's the word? If you continue in Jesus, you will be set free. Amen? Amen? He says, if you continue in my word, which is full of grace and truth, the law cannot make you free. Or let me put it this way, performance, self-effort cannot make you free. Because even though we're not trying to keep the law, you're, you're trying to perform to get from God. That's, that's what the law was all about. Trying to do something to earn God's love. Trying to do something to earn his favor. Anytime we're trying to perform to earn something that Jesus has already made for, available to us, that is not the truth. Christ, what he has made available for us is the truth. Somebody say, I believe the truth. There is not no my truth, your truth, our truth. See, that's all you can, you can, see, that can change. Our truth can change from day to day depending on the circumstances. <laughs> Today it might be true that you might be broke, but tomorrow you come into a manifestation, you're not broke anymore. That truth has changed. How I many you know he's, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? See, when we come to understanding the God's truth, that does not that does not change. But he says, if you continue in me, which is the word, Jesus is the word. You can't separate. Jesus is the word. He, the word became flesh. If you continue in my word, then you will be made free. As I just said a minute ago, free freedom really has two sides. It's what you're free from and then what you're free to do. So we can't just look at this and say, well, and we've heard it before, used all kinds of ways, I'm sure. <laughs> the truth will set you free. So share your truth so you can be free. Well, that's, that's not, because our, tru our truth changes from day to day. Really what they're saying is share your emotions. Release yourself. But that's not what real freedom is. That's not what real freedom is. And most likely we're going to do more damage than good when we just be led by our emotions. 
How many of you know Jesus didn't come to give us the ability to just live by our emotions? That wasn't why he came to give us, okay, now you can just live by your emotions. You're free to just live by your emotions. It's much more than that. He said, if we continue in him, then we will be made free. Let's go to John chapter 14. The law cannot set you free. But if we don't know the truth, then we'll continue to try to live by performance-based lives, thinking that that's going to set us free. John chapter 14, verse 6. Let's read it together. Ready, read. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus, he's defining truth at this point. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. Not just I'm telling you the truth. He says, I am the truth. He is the definition of truth. Not just he, he's the true nature of God. It says, just so you don't get it confused, so we're not thinking that the law of Moses was the true nature of God. It was a shadow of the real thing, which is Jesus. Jesus is the true nature of God. And he is the way to him. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the truth. Somebody say, grace is the truth. Grace is the truth. See, it's one of those things where you either, you're going to believe this, or you're going to sway back and forth based on the things you're going through from day to day. But you have to be settled that I believe that grace is the truth. Jesus is the truth. Not the law of Moses. Not performance. That can't set you free. So we, we define truth and we know that truth is Jesus. Let's go over to uh, John chapter 18. Your hands, have you ever had your hands so cold it's hard for you to even turn the pages? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> John chapter 18, verse 37. It says, Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause, I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. What is he saying? He says, everyone that is born of him hears his voice. He didn't say those that are holy, those that are perfect. He said, everyone who is of the truth, hears his voice. So I say, I hear his voice. Everyone. There is no one in here that's not hearing from God. If you're born again, you're born of truth, which is Christ. You hear his voice. You hear his voice. So how, how important is knowing the truth? So it's not just enough to know about him, but he, he's talking about, I'm talking about knowing him. Because when you know him, guess what? You hear from him with clarity. How many of you all want to hear from the Lord with clarity? I mean, he wants to speak to you daily. He wants to talk with you. He wants to lead you. His will is not for you to be deceived. His will is not for you to be confused. Everyone born of Christ hears from the Lord. Everyone born of the truth hears from the Lord. Let's go to 
uh, John chapter 10. Over the past few weeks, we've been talking about really knowing God. That has to be the foundation. This has to be the starting place for every believer. It's not, you know, here's what you do, need to do now to see quick manifestation. No, it has to be the foundation of you have to focus on the relationship that grace has made available. That is the good news. That's the good news is that now you can, you can establish this relationship. And we know you're hearing from him because you're born, you're of the truth now. So now that you're born again, now you can hear from the Lord because you're of him. So anything that we do in life has to be birthed out of the relationship. You're serving God. It has to be birthed out of the relationship. Because if it's not birthed out of you knowing him, then guess what? You're still trying to work for the Lord as though you were trying to do before you got born again. Well, let me get myself right so I can come to the Lord. It's the same mindset. It's the same mindset. So we have to we have to understand that everything we do has to be birthed out of our relationship with him. Every decision you make. Every every time you you want to serve God, it has to be birthed because it won't last without it. It won't last without it. You only do it for a season. You only do it for a short amount of time. You will have the, the equipment to endure all that comes with servanthood without it being birthed out of you knowing him. So the one of the most important parts of knowing him is hearing his voice. Amen? And he said, everybody that is born of the truth or, or, or of the truth, you hear from the Lord. Let's go to John chapter 10, verse 27. It says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. How many of you belong to Christ? He says, they hear my voice. So for those of you that think you have a problem with hearing from God, you can get rid of that now because he said, listen, you're my sheep, you hear, you hear my voice. And for those of us that think we can hide from him, he's like, no, I know you. <laughs> There's nothing that you can do. That. <laughs> Listen, I already know what's going on on the inside of you. Sometimes I think we try to go to God in faith. He's like, well, why don't you just be honest with me? <laughs> I already know you don't believe. But that's okay because I still love you anyway. And I, and I want to get you there to believe. That's his love. I mean, I've done it. I'm going to God in faith. He said, why are you coming to me? <laughs> Speak in faith. And I already know you're, you're struggling to believe in this area. But then as soon as I was transparent with him, Father, I, I, I'm struggling to, to believe in this area. Can you help my unbelief? He began to give me confidence and, and assurance that what he said will come to pass. He didn't look at me as of no use. You're not even good anymore because you came to me honest. I think us as believers, we have to learn to be honest with God. That's not a weakness. That's us showing that we need him. Right? Because he is our faith. It's not a faith that we developed in and of ourselves. Christ is our faith. So if you... Not don't have faith in a certain area, guess who, where you need to go to get it? To him. In his word. In your time of fellowship. Father, I need faith for this. Can you give me faith for this area? Guess what? He now in this covenant of grace, he he's gonna respond to you just like the person beside you. Okay, my I love you. All is well. Guess what? That's the faith you need. By him saying all is well to endure whatever situation you're going through. Now his word is, don't worry, all is well with you concerning this situation. Guess what happens? Now every time you think of the situation 
and is trying to attack, what are you thinking now? His word that he said all is well concerning you. He is just giving you the faith to endure whatever the situation is. Because once you hear from him, that's all you need. And he said, my sheep hear my voice. Those that are born of him hears his voice. And the faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Not what you read. Yes, I can understand what faith is by reading the scriptures. But when you hear from God concerning the situation that it is taken care of, the faith that comes out of what you hear from him, the assurance that comes out of what you hear from him, you can't find it in a book. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing from him. Hearing from him. When he, when he instructed me to walk away from my career, he said, I'm going to take care of you all. You'll never be without. All is well. And when you come out, you'll you come out trusting me more than before. And I'm going to make you greater than when you went in. So when the challenges came, the hard times came, what do you think was on my mind when those challenges showed up? What he said. What do you think I needed to, we needed to stand on when we were losing things? What he said. That even though it, it, it looked like a loss, from, from what you can see, it looks like a loss. But I mean, you know, he's always working behind the scenes. <laughs> That's how, see, nothing catches God by surprise. You might think that, oh, well, it, 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 sometimes it comes a little like he got surprised by that. He's like, I, I already saw that coming. I was already preparing the replacement well in advance. See, I'm teaching you about the truth. This is the true nature of the relationship that he wants to have with you. He wants to give you faith where you, where you may be weak in it. And he'll give that to you by speaking to you. And you don't have to be a super deep Christian to hear from God. You already hear from him just by the fact that you're born again. Just by the fact that you're his sheep, you know his voice. So there's nobody in here that should be judging yourself based on, well, I, I don't hear from God the way I want to hear. See, you don't want to confess that because you now know that just by the fact I'm born again, I can hear from God. And I know his voice. And guess what? The voice of a stranger you will not follow. But because you can tell the difference. Amen? You can tell the difference between his voice and the voice of someone that comes and says, you know what? God's mad at you. You messed up. God's mad at you. He's not. This is why you're going through what you're going through. That's a voice of a stranger. You don't want to follow that voice. That's why you want to know his. You know he's going to come to you in love and say, you know what? Don't worry about it. All is well. Just keep going. I already knew you was going to mess up. I already made that all is well. Don't worry about it. I'm still working it out in your favor. See, Jesus came to reveal the relationship. That's what Jesus came to reveal to us. So when you saw him healing people, you saw him uh, raising the dead, all the things you saw Jesus doing, feeding the multitude, all he was doing was manifesting the relationship that he had with the Father. He says, this is the truth. This grace is the truth. This, this grace, the relationship that's been made available to you, this is the truth. The law of Moses could not produce this. Trying to perform for God, you don't have to do that anymore. That, that no longer applies to you. For those that you are in Christ, now it's, I live by the word that come from the mouth of God. The word that comes from his mouth also produces the faith I need. 
See, we can't just take grace and just make it a curriculum and say, okay, well, you know, this, this pastor over here, he teaches, you know, a doctrine of grace. This pastor over here, he teaches, you know, it, it's like grace, a little bit of, uh, of faith included. It's like, you know, he, he's really mixing it. He's mixing it a little bit with the law just so I can, we can kind of keep us, keep us on track. And so you just kind of, you're just confusing yourself. <laughs> grace is a person. That person is Jesus Christ. And he came to manifest the relationship that's now been made available to those who believe in him. Because when God speaks to you, he's giving you the faith. That is, it's not for you to go try to accumulate faith. He'll give you, when you hear his voice, he's giving you faith. That's why you can't just go, you know, you don't want to just go through the scriptures and try to pick out one. That, that's good to, to know what the word says about what you should have. But I'm telling you, you can't get the faith for it until he speaks it into your life. And this doesn't take a, once again, a, a seasoned Christian. This is available to hear from God just by being his sheep. You hear from him. How many, if I, if I ask you to raise your hand, how many of you release your faith daily just to hear from him on a day-to-day -day basis? Doesn't have to be deep, doesn't have to be, it's, I just want to make sure I'm staying with him. Amen? It can be very subtle. I don't have to, I used to release my faith for, Lord, just give me a word that's just going to shake the earth and, and no, but now it's just, oh, just the subtle word of God. That just assures your heart that, you know what, I'm with you today. It might be a bad day, but I'm still with you. I didn't leave you based on how the day was going to turn out. I'm the one who's steering you in the right direction. Jesus said, I do nothing except for what I have seen the Father do. And he came to give us that same mindset because it says, well, we have the mind of Christ. That when we live a life that says, you know what, I don't want to do nothing except for what I see the Father do. He came to show that to us. That's what grace life is about. It's about the relationship that's been made available to you. Amen? Let's go to uh, John, 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter three. Let's look at verse mm, seventeen. Uh, you know what? Let me, let me, I don't, I don't want to go there yet. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. I don't want to go there yet. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. So we want to know, we know the truth, knowing the truth makes us free. We know knowing and continuing in Christ will make us free. Well, now we want to kind of get into what are we free from? What are we free from? What are we free to do? So that way we, we can really get an accurate understanding. Romans chapter 6 verse 14 says, uh, For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. Somebody say, I'm under grace. I'm under grace. Freedom, and what Christ is referencing and speaking of, is the freedom from the dominion of sin. The freedom from uh, the dominion of the sin nature. Being in Christ makes us free from the dominion of the sin nature. I Meaning that the, the sin nature is no longer dominating your behavior. It's no longer dominating you and, and instructing you. You're no longer a slave to the sin nature. When you're in Christ, 
and you're in it, which is the truth, which is grace. It says you're no longer under the dominion of sin, meaning now that before you wanted to do good. I mean, you know, when you before you were born again, you desired to do good. But the very thing you desired to do, to do, you did not do. And even when you tried to do good for a season, you still did bad. Well, that's because under the dominion of sin, even though you try to do good, you're still going to be moved to do bad. It was dominating your life. He says, by knowing me and continuing with me, you're made free. You're made free from the dominion of sin. Somebody say, I'm free. Let's go to uh, Romans chapter 7. One of the things we have to understand about uh, grace and as believers, we can't allow ourselves to really fall in the trap of thinking that because we're, we're under grace now, we're, we're lawless in a sense. Or, or there is no accountability from, for God where being a Christian is concerned. It's like, oh, you mean to tell me I'm free? I don't have to do nothing? <laughs> like, I can just go out and just sin? Like, there is no accountability anymore from, from where God is concerned? No, there, the, the judgment was put on Christ, but sin will still destroy your life. Amen? So, I mean, if you decide to choose to do that, which... Once you have Christ in you, and Christ is in you, and you know the truth, listen, the, the, the decision to sin is not going to come as easy as some would think. It's not going to come as easy as some may think. Say, oh, well, you all are under grace now, so that means that y'all can just kind of sin. No, people that are really under grace and, and Christ is in you, choosing to sin doesn't just, that's not the first thing you think of. You think of his love. You think of his goodness. You think of everything that he is. You don't think of how can I sin, not with Christ really in you. Because once he's in you, then he's going to begin to redirect your desires. Where is he redirecting them to? To do the Father's will. So just as Jesus walked on the earth to do the Father's will, he's working that same desire in you and I to do the Father's will. He says, now, because I'm leaving, I'm going to the Father. Now, I'll be with you, and we'll still continue to walk this path of doing the Father's will. Now, I'm going to be working it on the inside of you so that whatever you, whenever your desires are, it will always line up with the will of God. So instead of you trying to perform and keep the law, thinking that that's getting you closer to God, which is not, this life of grace, this life that's been made available to us, God is working in you to do his will. He's working in you to do his will. My God, that's so powerful. Because you don't no longer have to guess what his will is. You just have to believe he's working. Amen? You just have to believe that he's working in you. Even on, on good days, you have to believe he's working in you. Bad days, when you make a bad decision, I just have to believe that he's working in me. How I respond to my kids, I just have to believe he's working in me. This life is all about believing that he's doing the work in you so that what comes out of you will desire to do the will of God. He's completely taking us off the table where this life is concerned. He said, I just need a vessel. Somebody that will yield themselves to my spirit and allow me to work through you. So that we can continue to make an impact on this globe and reveal and glorify the father. You know, that, that word glorify means to reveal or manifest. So when God is working through you, he's really the one that's being glorified. Why? He's revealing himself in you and I. 
as Jesus requested that Father glorify me so that you may be glorified. He's revealing, he's manifesting, he manifested himself in Christ. And now he's doing the same manifesting and revealing himself on the inside of us to those that are waiting. The, the word says the world is waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. That's what he's revealing. He's revealing himself in us. Somebody say he's working in me. This life of grace is all about the work that he's doing in you. Not the work that you can do for him. He's responsible for the transformation. Under grace, he's taking the responsibility to transform you and I. And how many of you know he's well able <laughs> to transform us, to mold us into his very image? And all he's asking is for your consent by believing. Your believing gives sense for the transformation. Your believing gives consent for the transformation. I say your believing gives consent for the transformation. Father, I believe that you're working in me. You're giving him consent to work in you. Every time you, you believe, you don't need to believe for the thing. I just believe that he's working in me. And that's giving him consent for the transformation. Otherwise, I take it upon myself to transform myself. How many of you know that's temporary? <laughs> because it, it, eventually you're going to give up somewhere. He didn't create us. Your new life in Christ wasn't created to live without him. This new life in Christ, he didn't create. So when, you, when you're born again and you, you're still trying to live life without him, nothing works. Why? Because he never created you in your new man to live without him. So when you're trying to live without him, meaning you're trying to live by your, your emotions, you're trying to live by your own choices, your decisions, your experience, you're trying to live without him. By simply admit, just mentally acknowledging that you're saved or you're a Christian, but you're trying to live without him. And that's not what he created you for. That's not what your new creation is all about. The new creation is all about living a life dependent upon the Father in you working to produce the desires. So we, we have to understand what you've been created for. You've been free. You've been set free by knowing Christ and being in Christ. You're free from the dominion of sin. So you're free from sin, but what are you, you free to do? You're free from sin, but then you're, you, you don't want to get to this place of, well, I'm free, I'm free to do nothing. <laughs> Why? Because that's just going to keep you in the same position all your life. A Christian in the same position all of your life. So we have to understand both sides of it. Uh, let's go over to uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 4. It says, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who, raised, who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Somebody say, I bear fruit to God. So he had a purpose for, for delivering us from the law. Not that you can just go out and sin. Not that you, you can just go out and live a life, a selfish lifestyle. He said so that you can marry to another, which is him who was raised from the dead, which is Jesus. And being married to him, we will bear fruit to God. Somebody say, I'm married to Jesus. Me and two, you married to Jesus. We all married to Jesus. Amen? <laughs> Somebody say, hey, hey. We good. <laughs> no, you married to Jesus. Amen? We all married to Jesus. <laughs> there is no male or female in Christ Jesus. We are all one in him. Amen? 
This ain't no funny thing going on. We all married to Jesus. <laughs> Praise God. That's the only way you bear fruit to God. <laughs> Don't be ashamed. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Verse 6. <laughs> but now we have been delivered from the law. Somebody, somebody say, I'm delivered from the law. law. Having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. He delivered us from the law so that we can serve him in the newness of the spirit and not according to the, the letter of the law. What is your motivation for serving God? Some people serve God because they fear of, if I don't serve him, I won't continue this lifestyle that I have, or I may lose what I have. That's, that's serving in the mindset of the oldness of the letter. That I'll be cursed if I don't. I'll lose what I have if I don't. But now he's work, he working in you the desire to serve him. And so now servanthood comes out of your relationship with him, the spirit of God in you. Now your servanthood will be able to last and endure through the desire to quit, the desire to cave in and give up and go and get in your corner and have a pity party. See, when you're, when you're serving, is birthed out of him working in you. I don't care what comes against that. It will last. Amen? So he set us free from the law, not to go and live selfish-based lives, but that we should serve in the newness of the spirit. Somebody say, I serve in the newness of the spirit. You got to get that. It's so easy to, to, to just get saved, and the only thing that increases is our church attendance. It is, because that's what we've seen. That's what's happened all these years. It's like, okay, well, once you get saved, it's like your church attendance increase, but then that's it. It should be a, at some point, Christ in you should be producing some fruit unto God. You understand? It's not still not based on you. At some point, Christ in you should be producing some fruit unto God. It's him working in you now. So the, your motive for doing things changes. It now lines up with the will of God. But at some point, Christ in you should be producing some fruit unto God. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. It says, having wiped away, wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, and he, he made a, spe a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. What is he referencing? He's referencing the law. Say so he nailed the law to the cross and he disarmed principalities and powers. They, can, they cannot be, they can only use the law against us and Jesus has disarmed them. He disarmed them and nailed it to the cross. So he, can, he set us free from the law. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, we're going to, uh, verse 2. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So he set us free. The truth makes us free from the law of sin and death so that 
we can live under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's what he means by continuing in the truth. The truth is that we've been set free from the law of sin and death. That's the law of Moses. So now that we can live under what the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. See, it's not about being lawless. It's not about there's nothing I have to do now as a believer because he didn't he didn't set us free from the law to just live lives and say, OK, now you can just do whatever as a Christian, as long as you know you're a Christian. No, he said now you're married to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. But we once again, we have to understand what does that mean? Am I just supposed to know that I live in the law of the spirit? of life in Christ Jesus, or, or what does it actually mean? Let's go to uh, Romans, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 45. It says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, which is referencing Christ, became a life-giving spirit. It says, the last Adam, which is Christ, became a life-giving spirit. Let's go over to uh, Romans. Let's go back to Romans chapter 6, verse 18. Romans chapter 6. Verse 18. We've been set free from the law, but we need to know what are we being set free for. It's not just enough for us to know that, yes, I've been set free from the law of sin and death. That's great. But what for? What am I set free for? Verse 18 says, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Says we've been set free from sin or the sin nature, which had dominion over us, so that we could be slaves of righteousness. Let's look at let's look down at verse 22. It says, But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness in the end, everlasting life. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we've been set free from sin, but he set us free from sin so that we can be slaves unto God. That means that him working in you now, you're going to want to serve him. Just like when you had the sin nature. Even though you tried to do good, but you still desired to do wrong, that was you being a slave to sin because you had the nature of sin in you. Now that you've been set free, he said, now you can live life where you desire to serve the living God. And it's not in your own effort. It's not you trying to perform. It's just in you to do it. Amen? Amen. So we've been set free from the law of sin, but it's not, he set us free for a purpose, and that's his purpose. He set us free so that he can use us and use our lives to continue to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. It says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. How many of you are led by the Spirit? He said, then you are not under the law. The law had nothing to do with the Spirit. The law was all about the written ordinances. What you can do, what you can't do. It didn't require faith. 
It didn't require the, the spirit of God. It was all about you live by them. You try to do them. You have to live by them. And if you couldn't keep them, then this was the, this is what you get for not keeping them. But he says, if you are led by the spirit, then you are not under the law. If you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Let's go over to Romans chapter 8, verse 14. It says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. How many of you declare yourself as a son of God? Amen. It says, if you are led by the Spirit of God, then you are a son of God. So it's not that we, we've been set free to just live lives based on our, you know, now that I'm saved, now that I have the title of Christian, I can just still live and do what I want to do. No, he's, he set us free for his purpose. And we can't fulfill his purpose without the spirit of God living on the inside of us. And you can't come to the revelation and understanding that you're a son of God without the spirit of God in you. Without the spirit of God in you, you're still living performance and law-based lives. You have to have the spirit of God in you. So when he set us free, he set us free so that his spirit can live on the inside of us. He set us free so his spirit can live on the inside of us. Let's go to 1 Timothy. We have to be reminded why we've been set free sometimes. Because if we don't, if we lose focus on why we've been set free, then we'll, we'll develop this perception or, or we'll create our own truth of why we've been set free. Of. So I can be rich and, and, and have all these things. And, you know, I thank God he set me free so I can so I can walk in my prosperity that you will walk in the prosperity. But that wasn't his focus. His focus was that so he would have a vessel to live in, a body that his son Jesus Christ could dwell in and continue on in this ministry. That is why he set us free. So that his spirit could dwell in us. First Timothy chapter one, verse. Uh, chapter one, verse nine. It says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless. And insubordinate for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. So the law was made, and it still serves a purpose today, to show those that are not in Christ that they need a Savior. So the law is still working today. It's not that we're saying the law is no longer uh, valid is no longer valid for the righteous. It wasn't made for the righteous. And you can only be righteous by being where? In Christ. So the law is still working for those who are not born again. They may know that you might meet somebody who may know the Ten Commandments. They can tell you the Ten Commandments all day long. But when it comes about talking about Christ, they don't know Christ. They know the law of Moses. They know the Ten Commandments that's been pushed. And so they try to live their lives based on that. But at the end of the day, it's trying to, the law is trying to lead them to show them that you need a savior. You need Christ. So it's still working today. It just wasn't made for you and I as righteous men and women of God. Amen. So we know we've been set free from the law of Moses, the law of sin and death, so that we can serve in the newness of spirit. But what law are we as believers living under now? What, what, what law do we live by now? That's the law of Christ. Let's go over to Galatians chapter 6. Born again, new covenant believers, we live under the law of of Christ. It 
It says, bear one of verse of uh, Galatians chapter six, verse two. It says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So this is this fulfills the law of Christ to bear one another's burdens. Now we've heard that before. Most I'm sure some of you probably heard people saying talking about carrying the burden of you know so and so or carrying the burden burden of another, somebody that may be sick. You probably heard that before. So what does that mean? But this is it says bearing one another's burdens is actually fulfilling the law of Christ. This is under the new covenant. Let's go over to Acts chapter 20. Bearing one another's burden fulfills the law of Christ. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. It says, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Said bearing one another's burden is to support support the weak. Let's go over to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. So I don't believe in, in giving you words as I'm teaching without giving the definition behind them. So you want to talk about bearing one another's burden. I don't want you going out of here guessing what that means. You want to see in the scripture what that means. Just like you don't want to walk out of here, walk out of here thinking, well, what does free mean? That means I can do whatever? Yeah, you can do whatever. Go ahead. Then no, no, you need to see what are you free from and what are you free to do? Amen. <laughs> Romans chapter 15, verse 1. It says, we then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Verse 2, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. Verse 3, for even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So bearing Others burdens is you that are strong bearing the scruples of the weak or being being the strength for the weak for one another. Let's go over to First Thessalonians chapter five. Verse 14. It says, now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. Verse 15, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for you, for yourselves and for all. Bearing one another's burdens is your as the body, your strength in one area, you bear and you help those that are weak in the area that you're strong in. So as the body, what happens? We become strong together. He said that fulfills, that is love. That fulfills the what? The law of Christ. That fulfills the law of Christ. Let's look at James chapter 2 verse 8. See, when we, when we submit our lives to God, as we already have, and he's in us, he's moving you beyond yourself to, to others. 
that's what he's doing. He's moving because before, before you were born again, it was all about us, right? It was what well, I, I got to get mine. You better get yours. <laughs> you do what you got to do. I do what I got to do. But now he's saying, I need to change your direction and your focus from you to other people. James, let's see. James chapter 2. Let's look at verse 8. It says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And you do well. It says, if you really fulfill the royal law, which is the law of Christ, which is the law that we love others as he has loved us. He said, you do well. Let's look at verse, uh, let's look at first John chapter three. So as believers now, we live under this law of love. We're not, we were not set free from the law of sin and death to just go live life and, and re retire and move to an island. <laughs> he now has put himself, which is love, in you and I so that our focus was no longer on ourselves but others. 1 John chapter 3. Let's begin at verse 16. He says, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Verse 17, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in, in deed and in truth. Verse 19. And by this we know that we are what? Of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. It says love is the, is the evidence that you are of the truth. Now under grace is about the evidence of what you say you believe. It's, and the evidence of you being in Christ, being of the truth, which is Christ, he says love now begins to pour out of you. He says, and just as he's laid down his life, so also we should lay down our life. He said that's the evidence of you being born again. I don't know how, how vital that is, but you can't just take that definition of love and say, well, the world says this. We just got finished with Valentine's Day. So now the, the, the greater the gift, the more love you have for this person. So if you didn't provide the, the gift, the brother looking at you like, man, look, I got a bowl on the car. What you got? <laughs> this how this how grand my love is. That's, and that's the world's definition of love. But all we need was one gift. And that gift was Christ. And he said, those that belong to me will have the evidence of this willing to lay down his life for those brothers and sisters present in their life. The life of grace is about the fruit of God in you. It's about the fruit, the overflowing fruit of the life you have with God. And as that fruit begins to overflow, it begins to pour out into others. And it's not of yourself. It's pouring out. Paul talks about this. He's, he, let's go to uh, first. Let's go to verse 23. Let's say let's say in first John three. Let's look at verse 23. It says. And this is his commandments that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. He didn't say like everybody, but he did say love everybody. 
there's a lot, there's, you know, a lot of people you may not necessarily like, personality or otherwise. But that shouldn't, that won't, that shouldn't alter your love based on who you like. I mean, you know, Jesus knew a lot of people that didn't like him. <laughs> but that didn't change his walk. They didn't change the outcome. They didn't change his willingness to keep going by those that received or didn't receive from him. He still was walking the same path of love that he was sent on. Let's go to 2 Timothy, and this is the last one I'm going to close with. He, it's a pouring out. That's what it is. This life of grace is about a pouring out of a relationship. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. It says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. My God. He, he's being, it's about pouring out. It's about the God in you pouring out of you. And the time of my departure is at hand. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Verse 8, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing this life of grace is it's all about God in you pouring out of you it's an overflow he's pouring himself which is love out of you unto others Paul laid down his life he poured and him poured himself out until he was empty and when he was emptied he was done Every believer, it should be about me pouring your, you're pouring yourself out. Why are you pouring, why is it you pouring yourself out? Because it's God in you who's actually coming out of you. That is why he has, that's why he sent his son. That's why he's given us grace life. That's why he's, he's made everything available for us. He set us free from sin and death. Just so that he can live in you and pour out of you and use you as a vessel. In in First John, I believe it's chapter one. Uh, First John one uh, talks about the eternal life. Christ, how Christ came to manifest eternal life. He came to manifest. It was manif his relationship with the Father, which is eternal life to know the Father and the Son. It was manifesting before them. What were they talking about? They were talking about the life that he had, the relationship he had with the Father was manifesting before their eyes. And through grace, we have eternal life, which is to know him. So likewise, it's, as you're walking in this eternal life, the relationship you have with the Father will begin to just manifest itself before people's eyes. And as it's manifesting, it's pouring out into them. And they are seeing, they are actually seeing God through the love that's coming out of you. Because why? God is love. They're seeing God through what's coming out of you. You know that, right? Because God is love. So whatever comes out of you, that's their perception of who God is. That's just like Jesus walked on the earth. They, he was manifesting the Father. So that day, he said, when you see me, you see the Father. He said, there is no separation because what the Father in me now, what you see, the works that you see, that's him doing the work. Likewise, as believers under grace, it's not about works. It's not about what you can do. It's about what do you believe. And it's about God living in you, pouring out so that people can see who he is through your life. Amen. Did y'all receive anything out of the word today? Amen. Let's give God praise this morning. Hallelujah. Praise God. Father, we thank you. Our focus is on you, Jesus. We are vessels for you to use and pour out of. 